Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Wall, and I am also a clinical anatomy research fellow here at Seattle Science Foundation. Um, I'm originally from Denver, Colorado. I got my uh, bachelor's degree in anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I have also done some research at the Forensic Anthropology Research Facility at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and working in the Human Anatomy Lab at uh, the University of Colorado uh, brought me here and also led me to meet my best friend, Charlotte, who was a fellow here back in the fall of 2017. Uh, so jumping into it, um, I'm also presenting on the, uh, the clinical anatomy of the inferior uh, intercavernous sinus. So we'll be going over a bit of the history of the literature. Um, the relevant and functional anatomy as to where it's located and what the structure does, the embryology of the structure, and then its clinical significance. So this is just a, a broad image of um, the venous structures within the cranium, and we'll be focusing on this region here uh, in the pituitary region. Um, so. Just jumping into the history, um, in 1695, Ridley was the first anatomist to mention um, communicating venous connections and uh, around the pituitary and uh, dubbed those as the circular sinus, which is what today we would know as the um, anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses. Uh, this image is actually uh, from Ridley's uh, book from 1695, just illustrating uh, the, the cranial base. And then in 1732, Winslow uh, described the trabeculated pattern in the sinuses as resembling the structure of the corpus cavernosum of the penis, and therefore characterized these sinuses as cavernous. As cavernous. And then in 1881, uh, Knott studied 44 cadaveric specimens in which six of these had multiple venous branches of the sinus circularis inferior, and 12 had a single inferior vein located below the pituitary. So this is a uh, very basic 3D rendering of the, um, there we go, how is this? Perfect. Of, uh, this is the pituitary gland, this is a, a coronal view. So this is the anterior body of the pituitary. Here are the cavernous sinuses and the inner cavernous sinus below. This schematic has the sphenoid bone removed to show the, the sinus structures. Um, so this is the, what we would call the inferior intercavernous sinus. It's located inferiorly to the pituitary gland and superior to the cellar floor and functions to connect the left and right cavernous sinuses. It's located across this midline between two uh, membranous layers in the concavity of the cellar floor. One is an endosteal dural layer that adheres to the osseous sphenoid bone, and another is a meningeal dural layer that encapsulates the pituitary body. And frequently in the literature, we have found that the inferior intercavernous sinus sits about one millimeter in front of the neurohypothesis. This image is uh, as if we were inside the inferior intercavernous sinus ourselves, looking at the anterior body of the pituitary and the posterior body of the pituitary. And here is the cellar floor, and this is commonly where it would sit. So here are some of the, um, the adjacent structures to the inferior intercavernous sinus, which would sit right here. So it's uh, close relationships with the anterior capsular arteries, which are just minute branches of the cavernous inner carotid artery that uh, sit in the dura of the pituitary gland. And there's also the, the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the abducens nerve, and the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. This schematic shows that the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve does not sit in the cavernous sinus. However, there are variations on this placement. There's also the internal carotid artery within this neurovascular relationship and as well as the pituitary gland. Understanding all of these neurovascular relationships uh, can provide a critical insight into um, radiologic interpretations and a more comprehensive awareness during skull-based surgeries. So this is a sagittal section of this region um, where we see that the inner, inferior intercavernous sinus is sitting below the anterior body of the hypothesis as well in both images. 
Um, it is most commonly seen on these images as a crescent shape. However, it can also be oval or rounded. So in these images, we would describe those as being crescent shaped. However, during uh, transphenoidal surgery and cadaveric dissection, uh, it has been reported to either have a plexiform nature, um, an ample venous channel, or a combination of both of those uh, descriptions. And from coronal MRI scans, uh, it's been reported to measure roughly about five millimeters um, transversely, uh, but that's also typically smaller compared to the anterior intercavernous sinus and the posterior intercavernous sinus. It is typically smaller than both of those structures. And in a study performed by Green, we found that during cadaveric dissection of 20 of, of, excuse me, 17 specimens, the sinus measured an average of one and a half millimeters anteroposteriorly and one millimeter vertically. So uh, in summation, this structure varies in size and shape um, from person to person. So the functional anatomy of this structure is it, it provides a connection between the left and right uh, cavernous sinuses, um, and it functions to drain blood from the pituitary gland. Um, to the rest of the body. It drains from a number of different plexiform sinuses located on the pituitary, such as the anterior inferior plexiform sinus on the pars distalis, the posterior venous network on the neurohypophysis, and other veins located in the connective tissue on the pars intermedia. If the inferior intercavernous sinus is absent, which it has been reported in uh, several studies, then uh, these, uh, si these plexiform sinuses will drain into either the anterior uh, intercavernous sinus, posterior intercavernous sinus, the bilateral cavernous sinuses, or combinations of these sinuses. So the embryology of the inferior intercavernous sinus is best understood uh, through the embryology of the pituitary and the cella turcica itself. So the pituitary gland develops before the cella turcica uh, because the morphology of this gland influences the morphology of the cella turcica and can impact different uh, pathological developments associated with this region. So the pituitary gland starts to develop around Carnegie stage uh, six which, I'm sorry, 11, uh, which is the equivalent of four weeks gestation. So the adenohypophysis develops from uh, Rathke's pouch, and then the neurohypophysis develops from the infundibulum. Um, so between uh, stages um, 14 and 17, which is around six weeks gestation, the neurohypophysial evagination will form from the floor of the forebrain, described right here, and by stages 20 and 21, which is around eight weeks of gestation, Rathke's pouch separates from the roof of the mouth and forming a complete pituitary body. Uh, in the uh, second month of gestation, uh, the sala turcica starts to form from the anterior wall, forms from neural crest cells, and the posterior wall forms from dotted cord tissue. Um, and the second and third months of gestation are pretty important for the sinus region embryologically because various venous channels below the pituitary gland, uh, important for the inferior intercavernous sinus, have been observed in as young as 12 weeks gestation. So the clinical significance of the inferior intercavernous sinus seen in this image located more below the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland um, mainly is significant with these uh, three different vascular pathologies um, because the floor of the cella turcica made of dense cortical bone has been reported to be around 0.5 to 1 millimeter in thickness, so it's very important to be uh, very cautious during transphenoidal surgeries to the pituitary gland as uh, the inferior intercavernous sinus sits just above this thin bony structure. Uh, and confirmation of the presence of the intercavernous sinus and position of the pituitary gland uh, relative to the cellar floor can be confirmed by fluoroscopic and radiographic imaging prior to surgery to, redu to reduce the risk of intraoperative and postoperative bleeding.
So intracranial hypotension is a phenomenon in which there's a loss of cerebrospinal fluid within the cranium, resulting in lowered uh, blood pressure. Um, and several studies show that on MR venography, a dilated inferior intercavernous sinus has been correlated with uh, intracranial hypotension, which can be observed here. So this is going to be anterior side and the posterior side. This white structure is the pituitary gland, and this bulge is going to be a dilated inferior intercavernous sinus in instances of intracranial hypotension. Um, this becomes dilated and the contents of the cella become larger and engorged because the cranial contents are increasing the volume of venous blood to compensate for the loss of pressure from the loss of cerebrospinal fluid during this phenomenon. And a collapse of this sinus has been seen after uh, treatment has been administered in cases, uh, in cases of intracranial hypotension. Next, we have the carotid cavernous fistulas, which uh, result from an anomalous connection between the, the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. Uh, these arise most commonly from traumatic injury to the skull base, resulting in a tear in the internal carotid artery. And it is the, the inferior intercavernous sinus is relevant for, these, uh, for th this uh, pathology because when uh, a fistula occurs in one cavernous sinus, uh, the blood pressure will increase, and uh, to compensate for the pressure in one sinus, blood will try to uh, transfer itself to the other sinus and through the inter uh, inferior intercavernous sinus and the other intercavernous sinuses, it will uh, transition into the other cavernous sinus. Um, Common symptoms with cavern uh, carotid cavernous fistulas include uh, exothalmus, conjunctival chemosis, and other symptoms associated with uh, the eye. And lastly, we have pituitary adenomas uh, as cl uh, clinically significant um, pathologies associated with the intercavernous sinuses. These are slow-growing tumors on the pituitary gland um, that often invade adjacent structures in the cellar region. And these, uh, the intercavernous sinuses can often become reduced in size or completely annihilated from these slow-growing tumors um, if they become larger than uh, five milliliters in volume, which can also lead to reduced blood flow and bloodless dural incisions upon transphenoidal surgery. And that concludes my presentation on the inferior intercavernous sinus.